Welcome to the MMHP in the 99. Podcasting from the Michigan Rock Legends Hall of Fame in downtown Bay City. Channeling all styles and eras of Michigan music history from, from the, the city by the, the bay. bay. And now, Dr. J, Sir Fred, Mr. Mike, and your host, Scott Baker. Getting ready for part two with Mr. Steve Lyman from SRC. Uh, we want to thank all of you listeners for the great feedback. This, this episode part one has been a tremendous hit with you all. Uh, we've touched on rock royalty here and uh, some of the greatest songwriting and uh, spacious psychedelic rock to come out of that late 60s, early 70s era. And Steve had a healthy hand in it. And uh, in this part, part two here, he uh, he continues to take us into the the workings of the first two records with SRC, as well as uh, touching upon Peter Gabriel's interview on how it influenced Genesis, uh, partying down with Traffic and Procol Harum. Uh, it takes us into the the guitar, the teardrop guitar of his that was pretty iconic, and uh, leads us into the uh, reunions that came in later years. So without further ado, jump right back in here with Steve Lyman from SRC. How about Black Sheep? That was the big hit. You wrote that one, didn't you? Uh, I thought Glenn I read Quack, about Glenn, that. Glenn Quackenbush, more than anybody, okay. wrote Black Sheep. This, this is kind of a funny story. Is When we first started trying to practice Black Sheep, Glenn had the basic musical idea. Glenn had already written what would be Gary Quackenbush's guitar solo <laughs> on the organ and we started practicing it and Glenn said okay this is what you, you got to play this da, 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 and hold that note out if you can and uh, so and Gary Quackenbush he balked at the whole idea he says that's not a damn guitar solo because he wanted to play, you know, fast things like uh, Lonnie Mack or, you know, or Freddie King and stuff like that. He said, That's not a guitar solo. And the, what I remember in the room, I, I was kind of laughing, and people in the the other people, band members in the room, kind of said to Gary, "Just shut up and play it. <laughs> just just shut up and play it, and and see if you can make it your own." And 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 you know, in, in the end. Uh, that became like a signature thing oh, for him. Really? Yes. But he, he didn't even want to play it at first. He said, oh, bullshit, I'm not playing that. It's not a guitar solo. And, and, uh, How about the lyrics to that? That was also sort of like, almost like a, a questing kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, well, the, I mean, that runs throughout the whole album. Yeah. The day you remember, remember forever. I'll, I'll, let's, let's digest these words, because that's what the album opens. Okay, the day you remember... Remember forever. Now, people might say, "What does re- remember forever mean?" Well, what that means is, is, is sort of like a cosmic consciousness where, if you can remember forever, that means you remember everything all the way into the past and all the way into the future, <laughs> and not even a teardrop could make all the noise stop, like all the all the clutter of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, for all of the small days, you know, the trivia of life. Right. For this is, as always, no more than a black sheep could say. Yeah, I mean, that. Yeah, and, it's uh, such a great album, and, I and, tell you. And, uh, and at the end of the song, I'm not going to go through all the words, but uh, um, the very last line of the song, before Gary does his guitar solo that just like slowly fades into infinity, uh, that says, inside outside start to finish that means like inside your body while you're here and 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 outside in the world around you start to finish this quest so who who came up with this did you guys do this all together or well it was it by far it was mostly scott now and that's that's the thing that the the best con- contribution that scott made to the band was he he had all these wild 
crazy ideas and he wanted to put those into poetic things for the music yeah and the band delivered the goods on the music it just mm -hmm. fit those lyrics so well i have just hearing yeah. these words from you it totally explains why peter gabriel and early genesis loved src oh just because so that was exactly what they used for well them. i that yeah that's uh that's something that I, I can't think of the person's name. Somebody told me at a party once in Ann Arbor that uh, he walked up to me at this party and says, did you see uh, ever see what uh, Peter Gabriel said about SRC? And I said, what? Yeah, bullshit, you know. <laughs> uh, and he says, no, this, the, he was interviewed once and uh, I eventually, after quite a few years, I came across the interview, and I don't know if it was during the Trespass album or whatever, but it was it was very early, when when uh, you know, long before Phil Collins became their main singer. Mm -hmm, and sure. All that. Um, but uh, they were holed up in a cottage somewhere out in the country in England. And and these these people, Peter Gabriel and and Mike Rutherford, or you know, who's all the people? Tony Banks. Tony Banks, yeah. and Phil Collins. They didn't even have a record player, but the guy that owned the cottage where they were staying had a record player. So, and he had some albums there, and they got hooked into listening to the King Crimson debut album, uh, Procol Harum's album, and this album by this uh, group from. United States called SRC, and uh, so I, I <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't. Wondered, I, I've never talked to Peter Gabriel. Yeah, I, I, I had wondered if maybe he had heard it through John Peel, who was well, that's that an influential had, DJ who was yeah. a big, big booster of well, SRC. This, in um, another another amusing story about Black Sheep. <clears throat> When the traffic played at Grandy Ballroom for the first time, we got them to come over to our house afterwards. And at that point in time, this is this is sometime in the summer of 68. Traffic, you're saying? Traffic. So it will be the original with Dave Mason then? Uh, Dave Mason had left the band. So, left so all it was was Chris Wood, Steve Winwood, Jim and Jim Capaldi. Yeah. Okay. It's one of my the, favorite bands. Okay, they oh, came yeah, over to great. our... They came over to our house, and we were sitting around, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and just you know, and, and talking and having a good time, and you know, and when you think about it, you know, you know like Steve Winwood or Jim Capaldi, they're they're probably fascinated too because they, you know, probably never been to the United States, mm -hmm. and they, that they, probably their first tour. Yeah, it might have been their first tour over yeah. here, and in traffic anyway. Yeah, in yeah. traffic. Yeah, so. Uh, we were sitting around talking and everything, and, and, and they knew that we were a band, and, and we told them that uh, we, might, we got something we want you to listen to. And uh, we, had, um, we, we had the final tape just the way it was going on the album, back from the you know, mastering. We had it on a reel-to-reel. -reel. So we put the reel-to-reel -reel on, and here we are, you know, there's, you know smoke and we could see each other's or we could see each other's auras and whatever. <laughs> anyway, we started the song and, and we started right at the beginning with Black Sheep. And we had you know, we had the speakers had it up loud enough where it wasn't blowing our ears off, but you could really hear it. And and af after uh, Black Sheep ended with Gary's guitar solo just really very slowly fading out at the end of it. <laughs> I looked over at Steve Winwood, and he was kind of crouched down on these these couches that we had that were right down near the floor, and he was leaning forward, and he went, wow, let me hear that again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and wow. all, all of our eyes lit up, wow. <laughs> and, and then we said, no, there's more coming. And then and we, we proceeded to play through the whole album. And I, I can't remember what happened after that, but just that first thing where he went, <laughs> Wow, let me hear that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, for all I know, you know, and this is it's speculation, but for all I know, some of the people that we met, like the Who, or then you know, maybe went back to England and says, "Hey, there's this band 
from Ann Arbor, the town in Michigan, called SRC, and it's kind of interesting. You know, Pete Townsend might have said something to someone, mm -hmm. and uh, um, I'm I'm sure that when Jim Capaldi and Chris Wood and Steve Winwood, you know, probably told some people about it. And maybe that led to John Peel playing the album. Mm -hmm. uh, and, or maybe here, you know, it's a combination of different things. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. But, uh, did you guys play with Traffic on that bill? No. How did yeah. that end up? How did they end up at your house? Well, they were at the we, Grandy, right? We were, they were at the Grandy. And, uh, you know, it might have it been Scott Richardson because he, he was more aggressive in terms of like, if he wanted to connect with somebody, you went up and talked to him, mm -hmm. like uh, mm -hmm. where I, I was. I was a little more timid. Like I, I really enjoyed the music, but I'm not going to put myself in your face and say, "Hey, come over to our house. We, we got something really cool to show you." <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I'm not really sure how that came about, but uh, but we ended up we ended up with Procol Harum was at our house. Oh, it at least twice, maybe three or four times. In fact, we even recorded with them in our in our practice room. We recorded four songs with them. Whoa, on, you wouldn't on, happen to still have that recording. I don't know around. whatever's wow. happened. I don't know what's happened to it. And, wow. and and we were just, I mean, we were laughing and goofing around. And the, the one song that I remember doing was the Bee Gees song, Got to Get a Message to You. Okay. And And Gary Brooker was playing it on the piano. And he had a microphone, and he was singing it. Uh, Glenn Quackenbush was on the B3. I, uh, I think EG was playing the drums. I'm not sure, either him or uh, uh, BJ. Um, and I, Was this so, when Trower was in Procol? Yeah, when Trower was in Procol. Pr Trower wasn't playing. He, was, he, he might have been just standing in the room watching. <laughs> and... And I was standing next to the upright piano with Matthew Fisher, their organ player. And we were, we were, when Gary Brooker was singing the lead, we were doing those background things, hold on, hold on, in harmony with each other. And, uh, but the funniest thing is, is that Gary Brooker didn't know all the words of the song. So he was, he was making up words as he went along. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but being that I, you know, I eventually was out of the band and, 69 so i don't know whatever happened to these but i think gary quackenbush held on to these tapes for a while and i don't know i don't know what whatever happened to them they were on reel to reel tapes mm. was, was that on that four track that you guys got from that one studio yeah, yeah. probably yeah. yeah we probably recorded it onto that oh, and then mix it down onto yeah. onto quarter inch tape um the lost sessions yeah so oh yeah that's well that's that's another thing <laughs> later the um People that are aware of the SRC album, album that got released on CD called Lost Masters. Yeah, right. That, what that was, and this is after I was out, notably after I was out of the band. I mean, it was even after Traveler's Tale was done. Was done. The Capitol Records dropped the band for one reason or another. And maybe it's, they got... There might have been some arguments between the band and Capital said, hey, we're not putting up Yeah, but uh, Traveler's Tale didn't do that well, yeah, right? Yeah, I know. That might, have been I, that, that, that might have been part of the catalyst, yeah. the fact that that, al that third album kind of bombed compared to the other two. Um, but SRC, in the meantime, had built a studio on Morgan Road on the south east side of uh, at the dead end yeah the dead end right by us 23 right. southeast side of uh ann arbor and uh they had got a full uh full recording thing where they could you know do a whole album mix it down and everything master it there um and so that was that what they called that the morgan sound studio and i, I was only there once I got invited out there, even though I'd been out of the band for two years or so. I got invited out there when they had a grand opening party for oh, the place. Okay. And Arthur Penhowell from WAVX was there, and a lot, a lot of other you know, people that were trying to, you know. Well, get let's on go the back, though. Uh, you know, after you know, you released the 
the debut of the SRC, it did chart, right? It was it, it did get on the Billboard yeah, Top 200. It, uh, that you know that I'm not actually sure if if that uh, I think it did, but I uh, I'm not actually it, yeah, sure. Yeah, pretty of that. sure it charted. But it what, wasn't as big as Milestones, but but I I think in the long run, the the debut album SRC probably sold as well as Milestones, but it was spread out more because mm -hmm. some people that got turned on to Milestones, oh, they got another album? Yeah. And they went out and bought that. Right. Which one was Bolero on? The, the that was, yeah, that was that, on Milestones. That was on okay. Milestones, even though, as I told you before, we had been using that song. Uh, yeah, we, we had been using that song as a set closer ever since Possibly as early as the spring of 1968, even back when Robin Dale was in, in before we, before the first album came out. So it wasn't until we released the first album and and then Capitol wanted a second album. We thought, well, let's put that in the Hall of the Mountain King with yeah. Bex Bolero on there. And uh, and and for all the people that uh, confuse their classic music. It's not Ravel's Bolero. It's Bex Bolero, even though it doesn't say it on the album. It's Bex Bolero, and it was either written by Jimmy Page or it might have been written by Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck together. Mm -hmm. But, um, and uh, <laughs> In the Hall of the Mountain King was by Edvard Grieg, Norwegian composer, back, I don't know, around beginning of the 1900s or so, maybe before World War I or whatever. Anyway, it was from a thing called the Peer Gint Suite. And somebody brought the classical music album over to our house uh, one time. So this, was, this would have been probably in the early part of 68, brought it over to our house and we uh, all Listen really carefully to that album to see if it, if, if how that classical music would affect us. And uh, the first thing that I thought of is back when I was, uh, you know, maybe in my early childhood years. I no, not early childhood. Maybe like in sixth grade or so. There was a TV production in black and white. Of course, we all it was all black and white back then. Uh, the, the Pied Piper story. Oh, okay. A, a special TV production to it. And what they used in the TV production was bum, 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 mm. uh, and, and where it climaxes at the end, bum, 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 doo -doo 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 that At that point, the rats are all jumping off the cliff into the ocean. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so when, when, we, when we, SRC was listening to this, oh, I remember that thing. I remember that from that show. And and uh, somebody in the band, maybe Scott Richardson, said, "You think we could do that?" I said, "Yeah, we could do that, but then, you know, I can figure that out, you know." So, so between <laughs> Glenn Quackenbush and me, primarily, we we figured out, you know, it, and it's really not that complicated of a melody, mm -hmm. but you know. Doo -doo 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 but then that was then a crowd bring place. Bolero in at yeah. the end. Yeah, it's just. You know, that, that was, that's really uh, a nice combination. I think I, I think I would credit Scott Richardson with yeah. with that thing. After we Him mastered that tambourine. Yeah. <laughs> after after we uh mastered how to play in the hall of the King, Mountain King fairly well and we hadn't performed it in public, I think it was Scott that might have said one day, How about we go from that right into Bex Bolero? And he said, Man, yeah, we'll try that, you yeah. know. So we and and that ended up being what we would close our shows with. Yeah. Which and you know, and then another irony is that the the thing that got us a lot of attention, that song, mm -hmm. was not one that had any singing in it. It's just uh, it's right. just an instrumental. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean my my instrumentals my very past instrumentals would be like listening to Dwayne Eddy or the Ventures or something. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, as far as... <laughs> now, the first single from that album was Up All Night, right? Up All Night with uh, 
turn it into love. I think yeah, it was maybe on the yeah, flip side. But that didn't that didn't come out until because I was out of the band about two months before the album actually got released, even though I was on you know whatever ninety percent of the album. Okay. Do you want and, to talk about the circumstances of you leaving the band? Uh, it's 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 a a lot of it's a blank spot. We were we were under pressure to come up with songs and and. And I think the band thought that that I was one of the most musical people in the band that I should be able to, you know, come up with ideas. And if you know how music creativity works, if you try to force it, yeah, it doesn't work. doesn't work very well. And we were under pressure to get stuff. And one night after I think it was a Grandy Ballroom performance when we were we we had a hash out in our kitchen. And it got violent. I mean, uh, somebody told me later that E.G. Clausen smashed me in the mouth. I don't, I don't remember. If it was, it didn't hurt as much as the the band falling apart. Yeah. And and it's like I got booted out of the band, or or I, I don't know if it, they might people the other people might perceive it differently, but that's what it kind of came down to. And and when I left the band. I was just like stunned, like, wow, they're going to go on to possibly really make it big. And I was part of this and I'm not going to be in it anymore. And, um, but, uh, and it, it took, uh, several months before, before, uh, in my own head where I thought, God, I'm kind of glad to be out of that. Cause I thought the place was, it was turning into a kind of a madhouse. Well, it must've hurt because. You know, uh, Milestone's got a lot of attention. Yeah. A lot of radio play. Yeah, and I wasn't in it when, yeah, they, were, when yeah, they were promoting right. it. Right. And uh, do you remember, I I seem to remember that there was uh, some controversy about Up All Night that somebody, I don't know if it was a radio station, thought it was about drugs. Yeah. And it, 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 it I, I never like, heard much. I probably didn't hear any more. Yeah, I, I know you, you guys did. remember that. And it might it might have just been some rumor that someone started or whatever. Yeah. I don't even so I can't, I don't. Well, really I mean, know. up all night. I guess you could imply yeah. that it you know that might have a drug. Yeah, like reference when you say I'm doing it up all night. Well, that can mean a lot of things. Uh, yeah, it exactly. doesn't necessarily mean you're yeah. sticking in that meter. Yeah, it could have a sexual meaning yeah, for all. It, it could be sexual. Yeah, it it could just be. it could be just. That you're in euphoria because you're. So you, you were you involved in the writing of that song? Because that's a pretty good rock and yes. roll song. Yes. Uh, here's something I I kind of forgot uh, for quite a few years is is on that song. The only thing that I did on that song on the recording was the singing, the 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 high harmony background vocal. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened is is the guitar that I was using, I had uh, what they call um, flat wound strings, which which don't have as much of a zing to them as uh, the round wound strings. And, and Gary uh, was frustrated because the tone that I was getting on my guitar when I was playing, playing the chords wasn't the tone that he thought that should be there. So when we, when we recorded it, he he laid down the rhythm track, you know, with his with his guitar set on full treble on the lead pickup, and uh, and then he did the guitar solo on an overdub. So so the only thing that I actually did on that song is uh, I stood with my hands in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and now, it was the guitar you're talking about. Is that the guitar you brought? Yes. All right. You want to see this? Yes. Yeah. I, I okay. don't know. Did you guys see the guitar? Yeah, no. yeah, it's beautiful. Right. Oh, it's amazing. All right, I'll give it a Teardrop. Made by Herb David. Okay. <laughs> it, it started off, I think that Scott Richardson wanted me to be like the Brian Jones of SRC. So he <laughs> thought I should have a teardrop looking guitar. Well, this, this um, is not really supposed to be a teardrop. What it is, the, gu the guitar body is a guitar to pick. Mm -hmm. uh, notice the similarity of shape? Mm -hmm. Okay. And 
the same thing with the inlays are like guitar picks, even though they kind of get squished when you get to the higher frets. And uh, this, um, this guitar, I designed this guitar. My, my dad was an architect, so I was used to you know doing architectural type drawing and mm -hmm. had some training in school for that. And so I designed it. I on a, on a piece of paper, I had the whole thing designed exactly how I wanted it. And, and took it to Herb David Guitar Studios in Ann Arbor and said, make me this. And, uh, and they, got the, they got the pickups as well as the electronics uh, from Kalamazoo where Gibson was still located. And this probably came off of some other guitar because it, it, it never was chrome shiny. And uh, put Grover pegs on it and this used to be, it used to be a brighter green than what you see here. A little, I think the... What year did you have that made? This, uh, I designed it in the autumn of 67, or late summer, autumn, and it was probably finished around the time we were getting ready to record the first album. So this is what I used on the debut album. And, and Gary Quackenbush was uh, using a black Les Paul custom wow and uh that is beautiful the, the only problem with i mean these some of these controls are almost just like frozen they won't turn but the the truss rod in here no it's it's, a, you know, it's under mm -hmm. here the truss rod under here is somehow jammed where you can't turn it to, it's maxed out to, uh, i don't know it, it, it the neck stayed so straight for so long that uh that there was never any problem. Now it's got a very slight, to, in order to get the, in order to get the strings down to where I would like them to be up here, it ends up buzzing down here. Oh. And, and you can usually correct that with a truss rod. But, so I just hang on, I don't even use it anymore. Uh, yeah, we're anymore. just talking about the big concert. Well, of course, by the time this airs, the concert will have been over, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, coming up in August the 5th with yeah. Scott yeah. and uh, our good friend uh, Bobby Balderrama uh, and Mike of course, Brush. Yeah. Mike Brush, right? Uh, okay, everybody that's everybody been on, that's the, been show, on the show, <laughs> right? <laughs> including Larry. Uh, so, yes, indeed, that's going to be quite the show. So, there's Bobby, I, I really like. Gotta like that guy. Love that guy. Yeah, he is. Oh. Uh, he has a, and, got a good heart. And yeah, yes, yeah, yes, and, and oh, yeah. his wife Amy, she's she's a sweetheart too. And Did you see that Bobby is going to be playing solo at tomorrow uh, night? Yes, at Nino's, at Nino's Italian restaurant. With uh, he with can the, walk over oh, there. just by himself, just yeah. playing his guitar solo. Really? So well, yeah, that'll be fun. Uh, yeah. I'm definitely gonna. Well, go, we're gonna go and have dinner there. We, That's uh, a heck of a gig for him. He gets to walk across the street. One time, uh, <laughs> uh, not the last time, but the time maybe. The Maybe the time before that, where we went to to see the Mysterians at Scotty Sandbar, um, Bobby invited me to come up on stage and play along with him on a couple of songs, and you know, and I just kind of picked songs I knew. But they actually did "96 Tears," and I have never played that before, <laughs> so I had to really, I had to really use my ears and pay attention to make sure that I wasn't screwing up. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's a good person. A few years ago, wasn't there a reunion of SRC? and? Because well, I know Pete Andrews didn't want any part of it or something. Yeah, he, he probably didn't. Um, now, I don't, this is something that I don't know, but there was, there was a pretty serious falling out between the members of SRC and Pete Andrews several years after I was gone. So okay. I don't really know what what that entailed but uh, there was a lot of bitter feelings and um as far as reunions uh there there were some i call them half-ass reunions done back in like 9, 2003 wasn't there one at white's bar here in say you know? yes yeah that was later yeah on. yeah okay. but the, the, back in 2003 and 2004 we did a couple things and it, it didn't even involve Scott Richardson because he didn't live anywhere around. He was in, either California. in California or he was down in Tennessee. 
And on one of them, I did all the lead singing. <clears throat> but um, it's just it was just a few things that were done. And, and, and I wasn't enthused about doing them, but I figured if they're going to try to do this, I'd better be there to help out. And um, so the, the, the one you're talking about, Fred, is uh, in 2011, we played uh, a show with Scott Richardson on lead vocals, all three guitar players, Ray Goodman, Ray Goodman. Uh, you know, Gary Quackenbush and me, and Glenn Quackenbush and you know E.G. Clausen had already passed from cancer back in 2003, so I think at that one, you know, Pete Woodman played yeah, uh, drums, right. mm -hmm. and we did it on, in the month of June. We did it in the month of June at the Magic Bag Theater in Ferndale, Michigan, which is just on the north edge of Detroit. Mm -hmm. And then about a month or a month and a half later. We did the same show at White's Bar. Yeah, and you had a nice poster there, and that was done by, was that Carl Lundgren who did uh, the poster, or was that I Gary Gr Grimshaw? I think it was Carl Lundgren, yeah. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a copy of that poster. Oh. Um, I bought it at the show at White's, and we've got it uh, in our apartment in New Jersey. Oh, so okay. every time we go in the door, we see the uh, SRC reunion poster from Weiss Bar. It's, it's cool. And, it's um, really a good one. And, and then we did the we did the same thing one more time the next year, but it was Ray Goodman was not in at that time. Plus we had two female singers that were singing backup. That was you know, I think that was a, an effort to uh make it easier for Scott, you know, to handle the singing by having some people that could sing with him. And uh, and that was it, except uh, in 2017, the Detroit Music Awards, being that it was, mm -hmm. uh, being that it was 50 years since we had "I'm So Glad" out, they wanted wow. to give us the Lifetime Achievement Award. And richly deserved. So, uh, at that point, uh, on that show, I was playing guitar and backup singing. Glenn Quackenbush was on the organ, Scott Richardson was in front, and Robin Dale was also there, but he, he lives in Taiwan. He just came over to the States at the time, and he got on stage and helped with the background vocals, and then we had the entire third power band. Oh. Drew Abbott on lead guitar, uh, Jim Targill on bass, and Jim Craig on drums backing us up. And we just did, and all they wanted was the one song. I mean, I would have loved to play <laughs> Who Is That Girl or Black Sheep too, but they just wanted the one song. So we we played that one song, you know, got our award, and the audience went, hey, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's probably, uh, that's probably going to be the last attempt to do anything together because none of us really want to, try to do sure. that again I mean you know, it'd be one thing just to, you know in each of us individually if we wanted to try to do something musically but to try to recreate something that was 55 years ago it's it's pretty hard and you know about half the band is no longer here in this world right at least in the the, the version of the band that was on milestones E.G. Clausen passed away uh, the Bass player L. Wilmot passed away. Who else? Gary Quackenbush. Gary Quackenbush, yeah. yeah. Gary Quackenbush passed away in 2015. Uh, and I remember seeing him about town. He was always dressed up in a suit. Did he have purple socks on? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's mystic. Mm -hmm. That's mystical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Let me throw out this. One of my favorite songs on uh, Milestones is Checkmate. Did, yeah. did, did you have uh, much to do with the writing of that one? Yes. Okay. okay gonna, Checkmate. I got to demonstrate something on that song. So I'll just do this on, a, on an acoustic guitar. This is going to be a guitar lesson. 
Okay, a lot of people would say, how did you play that riff that you played? You know, that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well. That's very memorable. Th I'm the one that started that song, because I, I knew that the chords, E minor, and, and D, go good. So I look at the guitar and, well, this is an E string here. And the fourth string is a D string. So I thought, okay, what kind of make a riff like that? Well, here's a, here's an E here. So, so what it, what it, what that song does? Everything that is fretted on that song is is on that part there is all done on the fifth string. Just alternating with the E string and the D string. Whoop. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's one way or the song. other, that's that's the I love that. that yeah, it's, it's, it's so. So it, it's funny telling some, you know, someone that's a, a guitar player and said, how the heck did you play that? And I said, it's super simple. You know, and that, that's all it is. <laughs> yeah, keep it simple, stupid, right? <laughs> wait, 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 since I got the guitar here, I'm just going to play a very short version of the song. How about Who's That Girl? Yeah, you you uh, wrote that one with Scott. Yeah. Did you play that, that one? But... No. <laughs> play because I can't remember the words. <laughs> yeah, that was it's, pretty it's, awesome. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad. Right? <laughs> I'm so glad that's over. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> appreciated you sharing that one with us. So what did you do upon the exit? Tell, oh, us, tell us where you headed oh, into this. this. Is, yeah. I became a regular person again. Yeah. Just a regular person. I, I, got, a, I got a factory rat job because... Uh, I had to have some money coming in or I'm going to end up in the poorhouse. Were you so, married? Uh, n not right at the time, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I worked at uh, GM's Pontiac Truck and Coach, or, or is GM Truck and Coach in Pontiac. And, uh, you know, got made UAW money out there. And then uh, after about less than a year of that, I thought, God, I want to stay in a factory rat job all my life. So, I, so I, I'm going to go see the country. And I started hitchhiking around the co country, went down to Florida, and uh, um, then eventually out to California and uh, came back to Michigan and then got married to my first wife in 1970 in the summer of 1970. So when you were traveling around, but there was no music involved in that? You didn't travel with your guitar or I anything? I didn't travel with the guitar. If I was someplace where there was a guitar, I might pick it up and play it. In fact, now I don't know this for sure, but I wouldn't be at all surprised that when I was down in Gainesville, Florida, I went over to the campus one day, uh, the college campus. It was like, you know, a nice day out. And there was some people sitting around, you know, you know, playing songs and stuff together. And uh, 
There was one guy there that had kind of blonde hair, long hair. And I, I, who, who, who knows? <laughs> yeah. It might have been Tom Petty. I don't know. I mean, this is, be, this is before he, you know, this is like 1969. Oh, he probably would have been too young. Yeah. yeah. This is probably more point. like Greg Allman. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But I don't know when, I don't know when, when was Tom Petty born? Well, I remember he met Elvis Presley. That was one of those big events in his life. Elvis was shooting a movie in Florida called To Follow That Dream. Yeah. And, uh, he met him yeah, on man. set, and uh, that got him interested in getting Elvis records, and really oh, okay. was the maybe the the key, you know, for Tom Petty yeah, to start. I and I uh, but I, Gainesville was definitely on Almonds area. Yeah, too. let me yeah. tell you that band, The Insider. I would I share saw this. Last night. Did you see them? Oh, sir. Yeah. What did you think? Did you think they were really great? Yeah, and Lauren was on keys. He's coming to be our guest here. Two oh, weeks. Okay. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah, they were, I thought, were just absolutely terrific. It was wonderful last okay. time. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I, I got married in the summer of 1970, and uh, my first wife and I had a son born in, eight, in 71, another son in 73, and a daughter in 1978. Yeah, and they're all still here. They all live down by Chattanooga. But... Uh, our marriage fell apart like in, oh, like a little bit more than halfway through the 1980s. And then, uh, but at that time, uh, I was uh, working the job that I worked for like about almost 32 years, driving, uh, it's a Teamster job, driving a car transporting truck, delivering new cars to dealerships. Mm -hmm. And like I told you this afternoon, one time I did deliver to the dealer. What would you say the one? Well, we were thinking it might have been Dunlop Pontiac. Oh, it was oh, probably oh. Dunlop Pontiac. Oh, really? Because we were oh. talking about, you know, you yeah. uh, trying to transform the showroom into yeah, a Yeah, I, I delivered it right in the heart of town here. You know, and then I've all... And yeah. what year? What about that? Oh, God. I, I'd say it had to be... Might have been as mo as long as thirty five years ago. So in the eighties. So. Yeah, yeah, sometime in the in the the mid eighties or okay. no no later than the latter eighties. Yeah, it 80s. would have been Dunlops or Lavities then. It's probably Dunlops. Yeah. Okay. And then, and yeah. then and what, I mean, was, La it, was, it, was it Pontiacs or? Probably, or very, I can't remember for <laughs> sure, but but it was probably Pontiacs. Okay, that. Would but be if Dunlops. if Lavity is is it is that the one on Euclid? Or it did they have a different down. location? Yeah, it used was... to be downtown here. Oh, really? Okay. And they, they sold Oldsmobile. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. yeah, I can't remember for sure. Because right. even in later years, I delivered to uh, the one on Euclid, as, oh, as well okay. as to the Toyota dealer up the street farther, yep. as well as the Ford dealer that's up by Wilder Road, yep. okay. and the Chevy dealer that's a little bit Graf, yeah. And Chevrolet. Yep. So, wow. Small world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, and and that's another thing about music is uh, that's it's that's sad is is uh, people that are in the music business unless they unless they have a major success and put some money away wisely, yeah, they they can have some struggles in their later years. Mm -hmm. And I'm fortunate; I had like thirty one years there, so I got a pension. You know, how many people don't even have any kind of a pension? So. Yeah, so pensions I, are disappearing. Yeah, so yeah. I, uh, I, you know, I'm blessed to have that. You know, mm -hmm. and then, uh, the, so, and then my wife Eileen and I, we've been married since 2001. So yeah, you were saying that uh, tomorrow, right? It's the 22nd. Yeah, tomorrow is anniversary. Gonna, I'm going to remind you again so you don't get yeah, in trouble. Yeah, I don't get. I don't want to get my ass kicked. <laughs> <laughs> so. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. I'm going to tell you another story real quickly about the one simple task because you brought that up. But one simple task, if you know the song, it's got all kinds of really bizarre timing changes in it. And, and what I remember is this is always funny. Like when we played it at the Grandy Ballroom at the beginning where it's going, bum, 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 bum. Bow, 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 bow. You could see the whole audience going, 
And then when the timing changes, it all goes. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, and that's, that's part of the idea of that song, like doing, doing, you know, you have to do the impossible to get the, the keys to the, to, to the universe or whatever. The acid. <laughs> Didn't SRC play at the Delta Pop Festival? If if they did, it, it was probably after my time. I don't know. Okay, because that was. I, was I was sixty nine or yeah. 70. If it was sixty nine, because it was the MC five, the Rational. I mean, yeah, it probably. Well, was, they, there was that they played also at the Saginaw Pop Festival. It was the same kind of lineup, with uh, yeah. you know Seeger, the Amboy Dukes, the MC five. Because I saw Frost. SRC many times. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Because the. And if it was at the time where you where you would be familiar with the Milestones album, I was definitely out because I was on about ninety percent of that album. But when it actually got released, I had I was already gone from the band, and my you know my pictures on the back of the album has six faces on there. I'm in there. All, all the pictures right. of the band that existed after that were just five people because they just went with one guitar player. Because at the Delta Pop Festival, that's where Iggy got banned for life. <laughs> <laughs> they fell right on my leg. Yeah. He picked up the uh, dean's daughter. And oh, I think I heard something. Fell out that. right on my leg. It made Rolling Stone magazine. Oh, yeah. My leg did. Anyway, there's a video of that on YouTube. Really? There yeah. is? Yeah. Oh. Oh, hey, Fred, your leg's oh, popular. Uh, Sir Fred's leg on YouTube. But Peter Andrews, I guess, had something to do with Iggy, and he told him to. Put that girl down. That's the dean's daughter or something. <laughs> so, anyway, the, uh, life goes on. So, uh, did you do any recording after that? Have you, you have any not, records on your not, own? Not nothing professional at all. Just you know, you know, screwing around with people. You know, recording in their helping them out on the records and stuff. I mean, not even you know, like if someone if someone had. Uh, Bunch of mics set up in a in a room and over in front of the amplifiers and you know trying to and had a tape recorder going they might but as far as a professional studio type recording haven't done any okay no website or anything for no them to, for no people I, to look like up. I said at the beginning of this interview I'm not trying to sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not selling Amway and I'm not selling, Amway I'm not selling Amway or Amway or yeah. Yeah. well we certainly appreciate you coming by and you still yeah. play though yeah. oh yeah. But not enough. If my my wife Eileen will tell you, she'll she'll uh, tell you that I pick up a guitar like uh, you know a couple times a month and play a couple of Beatles songs and then put it away. And <laughs> Where do you live now? Uh, okay, I seventy five. We're we're very very close to I seventy five, about thirty miles north of the Ohio line. Oh, okay. Oh. If you know that area down there at all, on the west side of I-75, just north of Exit 29, there's a big Ford assembly plant where they make the Mustang. Oh, okay. We're right across the freeway from that, back in the woods a little bit. Are you anywhere near Adrian, or is that? Uh, that's Adrian is, I don't know how far that is from us. It, that might be about 60 miles away oh, or so. Oh, so good yeah. distance away, all right. Yeah. Hmm. Are you having any plans of uh, doing anything on your own before? You know, are you writing? Are you having any material laying around or any demos? I've, I've n not really, but I've got. I've, I haven't been very musically creative right. since it's, since since like a nineteen sixty nine and seventy that I was having a lot of ideas, but I never never recorded them. Okay, and uh, I didn't know if you had a stash. I, mean, I, I feel like I got the potential to do it. But I don't want to force it. Um, so it, I'm not promoting anything. But, it <laughs> might, but it, I think it might happen when I'm 80 years old. Okay. You know, if, if Tony Bennett can do it up yeah. into his yeah. 90s, right there we are. There we go. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Steve, for coming on the show, and thank you for your time and, and the history and, and the stories behind the music. Yeah. We uh, we're grateful for you to be here, and thank you for coming up to join us. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. It. it was really great. The MMHP is hosted on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and our own Libsyn podcast site. 
You can also search MMHP989 on Facebook for up-to-the-minute information, as well as both Dr. J and Sir Fred's album picks of the week, posted every weekend. Don't forget to look for Mr. Mike's local music live series, posted frequently on MMHP's Facebook hub, as well as Scott's Midmitten 15 from Harvest Canteen, featuring one-on-one interviews with Michigan music artists. You can connect with Scott on the web at scottbakermusic.com, Dr. J at michiganrockandrolllegends.com, Sir Fred at fredrife.com, Mr. Mike at YouTube at MrBT1. That's M-R-B-T-E-E and the number one. Brought to you by Michigan Rock and Roll Legends, located both inside the Bay County Historical Museum on Washington Avenue, as well as Scotty Sandbar on Evergreen Drive at the Bay City Middle Ground. On behalf of our hosts, Dr. J, Sir Fred, Mr. Mike, and myself, this podcast wouldn't have been here without the voice of the MMHP, Mr. Eddie Switek, the generosity of the Bay County Historical Museum, which hosts the Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame, as well as this podcast, Mr. Alan Garcia all of our guests and especially to the listeners we want to thank you 